Uh, welcome to the IST 40th anniversary research talk series. You see uh, the other three speakers, which are upcoming. It's uh, Tony Setra, Katja Valli, and Kelly Bulkley uh, through, during the course of the year. And the idea of these talks is to present the research done in the last 40 or even longer years uh, to give you an overview what ISD is doing, what the researchers in ISD are doing. And we start with Daniel Erlacher. He is a sports scientist at the University of Bern, Switzerland. And he is started his lucid dream research in 1999. So he's a few years active and is one of the leading researchers in lucid dream research. And he will present now his talk. So we welcome Daniel for giving his talk. Uh, please go ahead. Yes, first of all, I want to say hello to everybody out there in the world. <laughs> I'm very happy to be here and I want to say thank you for the invitation to this Dream Research Talk series. It is a real pleasure and honor to be a part of this party and therefore I want to start to say um wait a second i want to say happy birthday iasd well this year you will turn 40 and this is a good reason to celebrate and this series is probably a nice way to do that when michael approached me a couple of weeks ago and asked if i can do a talk on that i said oh my gosh i must be old <laughs> if he's asking if i could do a talk on the history of lucid dream research um, but well the ISD turns 40 and I will turn this year 50. So yes, it seems that I'm old enough to do this talk. And by the way, yeah, 1998, I had my first lucid dream and there the whole uh, thing started with my career in lucid dream research. And um, furthermore, well, I, I was also quite involved in some of the conferences uh, which were uh, done over the years, the last decade. So 1999 was the first conference where I actually sneaked in um, to be part of it. And in Copenhagen, it was a very nice first conference for me. And the regional in Gothenburg, Sweden, then in Roldak in the Netherlands. And then finally in 2012, when I organized by myself a regional here in Bern in Switzerland, um, where I am located right now. Dream research career started off is actually 25, 24 years ago. In 1998, I had my first uh, encounter on a conference on lucid dream research. And then I did the study year abroad uh, at Oregon uh, State University in Corvallis. And uh, during that time, I also contacted Stephen LaBerge and asked if I can come over to his lab in Stanford University, uh, where I then uh, spent four months um, to do uh, lucid dream research. And uh, that was quite a fun and re really fruitful time where I started to learn everything about lucid dream research. So if I maybe a little bit over present a lot of inspiration ideas from Stephen LaBerge, then that might be the reason because he was the hero at that time for me. And I learned a lot of him. But uh, I should mention that there are a lot of pioneers in lucid dream research, uh, especially people who inspired me, Jane Gackenbach, Paul Tolai, Keith Hearn. Um, they are all um, great uh, people who did a lot of lucid dream research and if you are really interested in those old stuff um, then I really recommend to get uh, this book Conscious Mind Sleeping Brain to have really a good introduction in the lucid dream research at that time. Well let's start and uh, maybe not everyone is aware what is a lucid dream. Well a lucid dream is a dream uh, while uh, where you are uh, um, reach the awareness that you are dreaming while you are dreaming and uh, when you have that you have a kind of control of the dream action and you can um, either be a passive observer in the dream or you can take an active part of the dream well some people still have never experienced a lucid dream and then i give i like to give an example how a lucid dream might feel like. So think about you're sitting at home in your cozy uh, dining room and you're watching via Zoom 
an interesting or more or less interesting um, talk about history of lucid dream research. And suddenly uh, Neo from the Matrix is jumping in or maybe out of your computer and you think, what? Neo from the Matrix? That's impossible. Maybe I am not in the living room and watching this talk. Maybe I'm still sleeping and I'm just dreaming about that. I'm listening to a talk about lucid dream research and Neo in the Matrix is just a dream hint for me. And I realize, oh, this must be a dream. So I am dreaming right now. And from that moment, so it will feel the same as you feel right now, your body and your um your thoughts, then you can start to decide whatever you want to do in your dream. So you could start to fly around, you could try and uh, reach a, a lonely island, have some sun bathing there and enjoy the time, or that what uh, Neo did in the Matrix, you can try to start and learn a new modern technique like Kung Fu or martial arts or whatever. And that is actually the, 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 the starting point where I ask myself, is it possible to use the lucid dream state to learn, for example, a new sport technique and then get better during wakefulness? And this idea um, was um, already, uh, already formulated at that time. So that's 1998. Uh, when there was this very inspiring dream conference um, organized by Brigitte Holzinger, where I met um, Paul Toda for the first time, a German side sports psychologist. And he said, okay, that's possible. You can do that. You can practice in your lucid dreams and uh, you can do it uh, without simulators uh, movements from a first person perspective in your sleep stage and you can get better. And that was something which was very inspiring for me. And uh, therefore we try to do some experiments um, to prove the ideas of Paul Tola. Uh, while he did only qualitative studies. And one of the things we did um, was um, done by Tadas Dumfries. Um, he uh, was a doctoral student for a long time uh, in uh, Heidelberg and uh, is now back in this town. town. And he did a study where we proved if lucid dreaming is really improving your motor performance during wakefulness. And we decided to take a very simple task for practicing. It's finger tapping where you have to produce a finger sequence uh, on a keyboard and you have to press it as quickly as possible and as often during 30 seconds. And you do that in the evening as a free test. And then you do it in the morning as a post test. And then you get the increasement in your learning effect during the uh, night training or whatever whatever you did. So we had four groups, a lucid dream practice group of 17 people. And they had to say, okay, when did you have the lucid dream? And how often did you practice your finger tapping task during that dream? So in this case, the participant had four times 30 second sequences, lucid dream sequences or minutes, seconds where he um, practiced the task at six in the morning. And then we noted all this information and we made the second group, the physical training group, uh, and they had to get up during the night and to practice for the same amount of time in the same time uh, in the night so that we have um, comparable conditions between the lucid dream practice group regarding the time of night and the hour of or the duration of the practice trial. And then we made a third group, the mental training group, which did the same thing, only thinking about the movements and do not um, do it, but they were awake and did it in wakefulness. And then we had the classical control group who just slept for the whole night. And when you look now in the data, you see um, quite interesting results. You see, for example, for the control group that they improved a little bit, but not very significant because um, they just um, got better because of the test um, times they had in the evening and in the morning. The mental rehearsal group improved more than the control group. So that was now uh, also statistically significant. And then the physical training group outperformed, of course, the mental training group. So that was a result which you would expect from mental rehearsal research. But now the question was, what about lucid dream practice? And in our study, they even outperformed from the percentage of increasement in wakefulness, even the physical training group. Um, even the, the difference was not significant, but there are similar results to the physical training group. 
I mean, that was quite um, amazing and interesting at that time. Um, and uh, in the meantime, we had a couple of more studies uh, where we replicate these um, um, results regarding lucid dream practice. So you can use your lucid dreams um, to uh, for different things in the uh, dream state to improve skills during wakefulness. So, but how to know that you are not dreaming right now? Maybe you are still in your dream and you dream about my presentation. So here's a one, uh, uh, one trick. You can test this. So just grab your nose, close it, and try to breathe out through your nose uh, with your mouth closed. And if you are not able to breathe out, then enjoy the talk because probably you're awake. If not, uh, if you can breathe out, you might be dreaming and you might think about flying around for the rest of the talk um, or whatever you want. So, but we come back to our island and think about another crazy thing you can do in lucid dreams, especially when you have a sleep lab and you can put the lucid dreamers in a, a controlled uh, sleep lab condition. So think about it, you're in a dream and then you say, okay, I move my eyes in different directions. And the question is, what will happen to my real eyes in the sleeping person who is lying in the sleep lab? And for the sleep lab, we can um, actually record the eye movements um, at the eyes and we can see if the eyes are moving while you are doing uh, the, the dreamt gaze behavior in your dreams. And uh, this is a very classical um, figure where Stephen LaBerge did that for the first time. And you can see clearly in this recording, which is divided in the EEG recordings, so now I have just to make sure that you see where I'm pointing. Um, so in the uh, EEG recording, in the eye movements and in the muscle tone, in the EMG recording, and this is uh, the recording for um, the time. So for uh, one, two, three, four, five minutes. And there you see the eye movements and then you have those left, right eye movements. That was um, a very interesting finding that you can really mark events as a lucid dreamer from your dream to say, oh, now I'm dreaming and whatever happens here, I, I am aware right now that I am dreaming. In that dream, actually, the lucid dreamer uh, thought he has an awakening. So he signaled for four times left, right, left, right. What what was the signal for, hey, I woke up. <laughs> um, but uh, as you can see, uh, the recording is not changing, so he was still dreaming, so it was a false awakening, and afterwards he realized that he is still dreaming, and he gave a left, right, left, right eye signal, but then he realized, oh, I did it one time uh, uh, too much, and then he did another left, right eye movement, and finally he woke up with the last um, signal here, where he really woke up, where you can see the EMG is coming back in. Um, when I was at Stanford in uh, 1999, uh, we started um, also a series um, inspired or done by uh, Stephen LaBerge, where we tried to um, show that um, uh, lucid dreaming is closer to waking perception than imagination. So what was the idea in that study? So is um, the lucid dream experience close to wakefulness or is it more like an imagination? Remember the, um, the practice data I showed you, uh, lucid dreaming was closer to wakeful practice than to the imagination condition uh, in our study. So um, Stephen was thinking about the same for eye movements. So if you do, for example, the small, uh, slow eye movements in wakefulness, and those eye movements are simply done by stretching out your arms and move your arm to the left and to the right, and follow your thumb with your eyes, then you have smooth eye um, movements. And you can see that in the smooth curves here in the graph. When you do this, that you try this in only in the imagined condition, so you think about that you um, stretch out your arm and you try to follow your imagined eyes, a uh, thumb, then you are not able to do that. You will have a lot of saccades, so you, your eyes will jump around and you will not have this um, nice um, smooth eye tracking, eye behavior. And now the question was, what will happen if you do the, do the same, ta same task in your lucid dreams? You stretch out your uh, dreamt arm and you follow your dreamt 
thumb and you do the eye movements in the dream. And the answer is, here is one of the successful lucid dreams. You have a nice left, right eye, left, right eye movement for, hey, I start now with the task and then there is something happening which looks very smooth and um, not um, rapid. And then there's another left, right for, oh, I'm finished with my task. So if you now compare those eye movements with the pictures from wakefulness and visual imagination, then you see that uh, the lucid dream eye tracking is quite close to the waking perception. And this is true also when you do the group statistics. So lucid dreaming, at least for the eye movement action, is uh, closer related to waking perception than to the imaginated condition. What, how many people do have lucid dreams? That was also always a question in lucid dream research. And can people learn to have lucid dreams? I, Michael and I, we did some representative um, um, studies uh, for Germany. And there we found, which are uh, numbers which are found also worldwide, that uh, about half of the population uh, have never had a lucid dream means on the other side, half of the population had at least one lucid dream experienced um, during their lifetime. And if you take a closer look and the frequency of how often those people have lucid dreams, uh, you can make another cutoff uh, on frequent lucid dreamers, which start at one lucid dream per month and more. And if you look at the data, so about 20% of the population have lucid dreams on a higher frequency. And if you look now for the high frequent lucid dreamers, so people who have lucid dreams once or more often in a week, then you have only 1%. And this would, um, com would be comparable for Germany uh, to the um, population of the city of Stuttgart. Well, not all the lucid dreamers live in Stuttgart. So you have to do a lot of searching when you try to do some lucid dream experiments in the sleep lab, um, because uh, there are well, on percent, and you have to search for that. And therefore, the question was always, can we um, learn lucid dream? So is lucid dreaming a learnable skill or ability? And again, um, Stephen did at that time um, some um, pioneer observation on that topic where he just counted his own lucid dream amount per month. So those are the month and those are the numbers of lucid dreams he experienced in that month. So in the first month, four lucid dreams, second month, six lucid dreams and so on. And there were some events where he had a little bit more of lucid dreams, but then he developed his um, technique, which is called the mild technique, the mnemonic induction of lucid dreams. And you can see if you have a technique, which is um, is effective, you can indeed increase your lucid dream experience. So he was finally able to have almost lucid dreams at will at point C. And another interesting observation, when you stop to the task, so when you stop to do um, the exercises to have lucid dreams, then your lucid um, um, experience will also go back. So it speaks more for an ability. So if you don't do your tasks and the exercise, um, your lucid dream frequency will go back to maybe zero. zero. Well, and uh, now the question is, what are the most effective lucid dream induction techniques out there? And if you look in the Hollywood movies, then we see, oh, there are a couple of different techniques. So you have the biopod induced lucid dreams, for example, in the matrix or in existence, and you have the drug induced lucid dreams um, where you use some substance to induce lucid dreams. Um, but what about the real research on lucid dream induction? Uh, well, it's almost quite uh, similar to that. So the idea is that we really go to the central nervous system and try to um, excite those areas which are responsible somehow for lucidities. And there was this idea that uh, the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex or the frontal cortex in general might be a key player in lucidity. And therefore, the idea was to do some um, studies where we try to activate those areas of the brain. So again, Tadas um, did uh, one of those studies and Michael was also involved uh, that time in, uh, in Mannheim. And we use the TDCS to um, 
um, activate the frontal uh, parts of the brain. So you see the setup. So here are two electrodes with a TDCS stimulator where you can produce more uh, currencies to get an activation of those areas. And then you have uh, uh, an experiment with different nights, an adaptation night, then one night where you do the real TDCS um, stimulation and other nights where you just do uh, or have a sham condition where you just pretend that you give the stimulation just to control the expectancies of the participants. And what we found at that time is that lucid dream uh, frequency is indeed uh, you can indeed induce a little bit more lucidity, um, but if you look closely, it's only possible when you have already frequent lucid dreamers, they have a an, um, an benefit of this um, procedure of TDCS on the frontal lobe. In the meantime, well, we also know that maybe those encouraging uh, results in the beginning from Ursula Foss about the activation of the frontal cortex might be uh, a methodological flaw, and maybe it's not the frontal lobe which is uh, that important for lucidity, and therefore more research is needed. But I thought when I have the chance, then I should also have a disclaimer <laughs> out of that study that you should not always trust um, on one single study, which shows that uh, maybe uh, some technique is quite helpful to induce your lucid dreams, because um, uh, there are um, the, the products out there who claim that, for example, with TACS, you can uh, have lucid dreams or with supplements that you can have lucid dreams. I would recommend not to spend the money on those products and rather uh, try some cognitive techniques to induce lucid dreams. Well, coming back to my final experiment, uh, which I want to present. Uh, which is also inspired by those um, pioneers in lucid dream research. And there is um, also um, uh, Jane Gackenbach and Stephen LaBerge to mention, because they produced over the years nice um, uh, outlets on lucid dream research. For example, Stephen LaBerge with his nightlight. And there he had always um, an experiment for at home. So he encouraged lucid dreamers to do experiments which are well-defined in his book, in his nightlight and collect data on um, lucid dream research at home. A um, little bit different in the lucidity letter, but it's also recommended to have a look in there because it's over 10 years, a uh, nice collection of different dream research activity. And from that, I was inspired also by Paul Tolai, or we were uh, inspired at that time about the abilities of dream characters. Just think about the Neo in the Matrix, um, which is appearing in your lucid dream. Um, uh, you could wonder of, uh, about his um, mental abilities. So you could think about, is this dream character really a person or himself. So you could start a conversation with them. You could say, Neo, could you please draw a picture of yourself? Or could you please write some poem or do some uh, mathematics? What is seven times five? And you could test his mental abilities. And from that, he could answer and give you some ideas on what he might have to say to these questions. And from the answers, you could speculate about the consciousness and the abilities of dream characters in lucid dreams, which is a very fascinating topic. So, and uh, Stephen uh, Paul Tolai brought that topic up in a paper um, very early. And he said, well, uh, dream characters have some kind of abilities in their dreams or in his dreams or in lucid dreams. And he was claiming a little bit from his background in Gestalt theory, that there might be some abilities which are unexpected or independent of the dreamer by himself. And that was a quite interesting idea. And we tried to challenge this with something similar to the nightlight um, online, uh, experiments at home from Stephen LaBerge. We uh, did for a couple of years also the online experiments, uh, Klartraum, in Germany. And we invited lucid dreamers to take part in these experiments. And in that experiment, we had a very simple idea. So we wanted to see how independent are dream characters. So we asked our dream characters for the dream. So imagine this is the dream character. That's me as a young doctoral student. And that was a 
uh, another student uh, from us, that this might be the dream situation and he is the dream ego and he asks the dream character a question about counting fingers. So the task was lift some amount of fingers and ask the dream character, how many fingers do you see uh, where, uh, um, um, at, on my hands in this open condition? And the dream character answers, oh, well, these are seven fingers. And then do a second condition where you hide your arms and you make another number of fingers and you ask again the participant to tell how many fingers do I hold up? In the hidden condition during wakefulness, you wouldn't have a chance except for guess. Yeah? But what, it's, what is the result for the lucid dream state? So how many correct answers did we get in the hidden and in the open condition? Well, and um, that's what you would expect. So 100% in the open condition. And for the lucid dream, we have only 62% of correct answers. So a couple of dream characters were not able to count the correct number of fingers in the lucid dream in the open condition. But what about the hidden condition? Well, you would expect the chance with 9%. And in the lucid dream, again, the dream characters were able to have the correct number of fingers in 66%. So they knew more about the number of fingers than chance. And if you even take out the incorrect participants, dream characters from the experiments, then you see that basically um, in the correct and in the incorrect condition, the dream characters were um, just guessing uh, or knew about the correct number of fingers you hold up. Well, this might be taken as an indication that the uh, dream characters might be not an independent being in your dream world. And the cognitive abilities of the dream character seems to depend somehow on the prior knowledge or expectation of the participants. Well, that was also a very um, interesting way to organize um, lucid dream research, even in a very simple home setting, which was inspired also by the pioneers of lucid dream research. And here I want to say thank you for listening to um, this small introduction to lucid dream history and some of the, at least for me, inspiring um, experiments uh, in this area. And I'm happy now for a uh, discussion with questions from your side.